Real Virginia is proudly produced by the Virginia Farm Bureau Federation. Since 1926, Farm Bureau has been working to preserve Virginia farms and our rural heritage. Visit our website at VAFB.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Real Virginia, a show about Virginia agriculture and the people who produce the wonderful local products we enjoy. Brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. If you're thinking of bringing an all-terrain vehicle home for the holidays, remember to be safe. Chef Tammy Brawley brings us her personal recipe for a classic dish, Chicken Marbella. And we visit Montgomery County for this week's County Agricultural Close-Up Feature. Welcome back to Real Virginia, everyone. We're coming to you this week from the banks of the Mattapanai River in King William County. The pandemic has led to a burst of outdoor activities, including riding all-terrain vehicles. Ricky Gibson reports that safety experts are concerned that some riders are missing an essential step, the safety course. According to a survey of accidents last summer conducted by World Against Toys Causing Harm Incorporated, between March and September of 2020, there was a 39% increase in injuries related to all-terrain vehicle use. It's not a toy. Um, you know, growing up on a farm, I understand at, at a young age, kids want to do what mom and dad wants to do. Kurt Porterfield is the training coordinator for the Virginia Tech Environmental Health and Safety Program. He conducts regular ATV safety workshops with students across the state and says the risks are real. When you look at the numbers, 500 people lose their life every year and over 100,000 people are seriously injured. Uh, a big proportion of that is children. And part of the aspect of getting a, a child trained is teaching them the, fun, the basic fundamentals of ATV safety. One of those things is knowing the ATV. We have laws and regulations to help protect us. Stickers on ATVs basically say no, no riders under 16 years of age. There's a reason for that. One of the laws states that you can only operate an ATV under 16 if it's only 90 cc's. ATVs, most on farms, they're non-existent. Uh, at that horsepower. Under Virginia law, a 90 cubic centimeter engine is suitable for riders age 12 to 15. Younger than that and children are only allowed to ride a 70 cc sized ATV. Porterfield says in addition to riding too large a machine, young riders often skip the most basic safety equipment. You cannot ride an ATV without a helmet. Uh, there's, there's just too much of a risk there. and. Typically, when you understand that rollovers, um, flips, those types of accidents occur without that helmet, that's, that's usually one of the bigger problems uh, in, the, in the accident. Wear a helmet because a lot of people, you know, especially when you're on a bike, like I know a lot of children ride bikes and they just don't wear helmets, and they probably should wear a helmet, especially when they're on an ATV and not a bike. Callie Musselwhite is taking an ATV safety course from Porterfield. A lot of the safety steps she learned are common sense, like checking your ATV's tire pressures and other equipment before riding, and being careful on slopes. In addition to choosing the proper ATV for a rider's age, Porterfield teaches his students a number of other safety guidelines. Always wear a Department of Transportation approved and properly fitting helmet. Wear safety glasses or goggles. Wear sturdy gloves, long sleeves, and long pants. Wear sturdy boots or shoes and tuck in your shoelaces so they don't snag on brush. These tips hold true for adults as well as child riders. Porterfield says everyone is tempted to just hop on an ATV for a quick ride, but adults need to follow the rules too. Everyone should take an ATV course. Um, you know, one, one of the biggest things that I have in my life is a smart person learns by his or her mistakes, but a wise person learns from someone else's. Um, I ask people all the time, do, do you, when I teach this class, do you know anybody who's had an accident on an ATV? 
And it's very hard for me to find someone who hasn't. Between 1982 and 2018, there were at least 15,744 ATV-related fatalities, according to the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Almost one-fifth of those involved children younger than 16. Other safety tips for all ATV riders include no passengers, only ride off-road at safe speeds, and young riders should be supervised at all times. You can take an online safety course at atvsafety.org or talk to a Virginia ATV dealer on where to find an in-person course. In Craig County, Virginia, I'm Ricky Gibson reporting. In addition to the recreational uses, all-terrain vehicles have become essential work vehicles on many farms. But whether they're being used for work or for play, ATVs need to be used in a safe manner. According to the Consumer Product Safety Commission, 2,258 deaths were reported nationwide relating to riding ATVs, off-highway vehicles, and utility terrain vehicles from 2015 to 2017. 48% of those involved children under age 16. The accident rate increased when underage riders used adult ATV models. Other standard practices for safe riding include always using a helmet and protective gear and no passengers on single seat equipment. Hi, today we're going to be talking about homestead corn from the ground up. Please stay tuned. We're stronger together, especially at this difficult time. For over 90 years, we've watched our membership grow and we're honored to be part of such a special community. Thank you to the farmers who provide for us every day. Virginia Farm Bureau is proud to serve our members, their families, and to give back to our local communities. That's the Farm Bureau way. Corn harvest is about finished for this year, but not all corn is the same. Chris Mullins with Virginia Cooperative Extension visits with a gardener who raises corn for milling from the ground up. Well, hello and welcome. Today we're in Goochland County, Virginia. We're with Betsy Trice and Penny, mm -hmm. and we're at Peace Mill Farm, right? And we're talking today about corn. And Betsy, this is not, this is not sweet corn. What, what is this? This is a dent corn. This is Hickory King dent corn. Okay, okay. So this is, um, you know, with sweet corn, you harvest it green, eat it delicious. Mm -hmm. This is a little different while you're, you're doing here, right? Yeah, so we, we raise it and we actually let it, um, let the ears dry. Um, okay. And so right now, the, uh, you can tell everything's starting to dry down, right. um, which is, you know, way too late for sweet corn, but it's perfect for this dent corn because um, we, we raise it to grind into cornmeal uh, or we grind it coarsely to make into grits or polenta. Okay, so this is, yeah, that's perfect. And this plot you've got here is not a huge plot. How, how big an area are you, uh, do you have your corn? Um, it's about 10 by 70 okay. feet. So for some home gardeners, this seems like a lot, but for others who have a large garden, they could probably think about doing something like this. Yeah, and we, we get all the corn that we need from this plot for the year. So. Well, you know, I know you've got some other types up there that we can go look at, and maybe you can show us what you do with the corn and how you, how you uh, take care of it after, after you harvest it. Sure. Well, Betsy, so this is the white dent corn that you're growing in that patch we were just in, right? Mm -hmm. But I see here you've got some different types of corn. It's amazing looking, different yeah. colors. Yeah, these are a bit more visually appealing. This is another type of corn. Um, it's, a, it's a flint corn. Um, so it's, um, it, the starch makeup is just a little bit different. Okay. So besides it looking different as well. Um, this is often used for like ornamental purposes in the fall, but you can eat it as well. Okay, so somebody could decorate with it and then it could be processed and you could make it into meal or flour even. Yeah, for sure. So Betsy, on that plot we were in, you were telling us how many of these jars do you think you harvest out of there of, of kernels like this? Uh, we get about five, five jars or so, and those there are gallon jars. So gallon jars? Gallons, yeah. Is that last year family for the... Oh, plenty for the year. We actually still have a couple jars left over from last year's harvest. Oh, so. wow. So Betsy, how do you take the corn from this point? How do you get the kernels off the cob? I use this corn sheller right here. 
Okay. Wow, it's a kind of older looking piece of equipment, right? Yeah, this is definitely an, an older version. Um, and you can actually still find these like at antique malls and things like that. Oh, great. Yeah. And there's probably other ways that you can get it off. Yeah, you can you can do it, you know, by hand. Um, they also sell, Southern Exposure um, sells a, a smaller, just handheld corn sheller. And it's just like a steel ring similar to this, but you just slide it on and okay. help save your hands a little bit. Okay. Well, let's see what this older technology does. Here. Sure. Oh wow, that there is we go. wonderful. That is great. <laughs> okay, so we got a bunch of kernels in here now. So now we take it and you take it to another piece of equipment, right? Yep, now we take it to the grain mill um, and we can grind it into finer flour and meal. Let's check that out too. Well, Betsy, this is a little bit newer piece of equipment. What have you got here? This is a grain maker grain mill. So this is what I use to turn the whole corn into a meal. Oh, wow. Okay. So this is, and this is some of the corn that you harvested out of your plot, the white dent corn. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Well, let's see how it, we'll see what, how it works. Sure. Oh, that is great. So it just grinds it right up. And I guess you were telling me you can adjust this to make it finer or more coarse, depending on what you want. Yeah, there's a, a wheel here that adjusts how close the grinding plates are. So we've, I've got it set here a little bit gritty um, for grits and polenta, and I can turn it and tighten it up to make a finer meal for making cornbread. Oh, okay. This is so interesting. Thank you for letting us come out today to your farm and see uh, what you're doing with corn. Yeah, really you're welcome. It. Well, for more information about growing different types of corn in the home garden, contact your local county extension office and talk to a master gardener. For From the Ground Up, I'm Chris Mullins. We'll see you next time. From the Ground Up is presented with the generous advice and assistance of Virginia Cooperative Extension. Visit their website at ext.vt.edu. Hi, I'm Chef Tammy Brawley from The Green Kitchen. Coming up, Chicken Marbella. We hope you'll stay with us. And now, a sneak peek into a day in the life of a Virginia dairy cow. They get their day started. They have some lunch. Get some exercise. Spend time with their friends. And then end their day with dairy sweet dreams. Real dairy, real life, real delicious. There are hundreds of tasty ways to prepare chicken, but Chef Tammy Brawley has a few favorites, including this classic chicken marbella recipe from the heart of the home. Hi, I'm Chef Tammy Brawley and welcome to Heart of the Home. We are going to do a dish today called chicken marbella, one of my favorite dishes. We have got some chicken legs. We're gonna be using some olives and some capers and some prunes. Very healthy dish for you and I'm excited to make it. What we're gonna do first of all is we're gonna actually put the chicken and the solid ingredients of the, I'm using chicken legs. You can certainly use breast in this if you prefer. The main thing about this is that you do wanna use bone in chicken. It gives it a lot more flavor. It takes a little longer to cook than boneless, but it is absolutely worth it. And what we're going to do is over top of those chicken, we are going to add bay leaves and we are adding prunes and green olives. Um, you can certainly use a different olive if you choose. I love all of them, um, so whatever one you wish. And the capers as well. And then we're going to come back and we're going to uh, make a sauce to go over the top. We have garlic and dried oregano. <clears throat> chopped garlic. To that, we're going to add red wine vinegar, a little olive oil, and a little salt and pepper. Now what we're going to do is we're going to whisk that up with our fork. We're going to pour that over the chicken. This recipe calls for marinating this overnight and I really could not stress how important that is. When it comes out of the refrigerator the next day, it's going to go into a 350 degree oven for about an hour. All right, so it's marinated overnight. Our chicken, prunes, capers, and olives, garlic, and some dried oregano. And now we're going to come back and we're going to sprinkle some brown sugar over it.
I'm going to pour a little wine over the top. It's going to be the base for the sauce. And now we're going to go into a 350 degree oven for about an hour. I would actually stop about a halfway through that process with a basting brush and baste the juices. All right, and there you have it. Through the magic of television, we have a dish already ready for you. Chicken Marbella with prunes and olives and capers, garlic and dried oregano, some white wine and brown sugar. We're going to put it in our serving bowl. I love this flavor. The prunes are so sweet at the end of this cooking process and the savoriness of the olives. Delicious sauce on the bottom. You want to top this off with some finished chopped parsley. Beautiful green color on top. All right, and there you have it. Chicken Marbella, prunes, olives, capers, garlic, oregano, brown sugar, and white wine. Enjoy this dish. I'm Chef Tammy Brawley with The Green Kitchen. We hope you'll join us next time on Heart of the Home. Recipes from the Heart of the Home can be found on the Virginia Farm Bureau website at vafb.com slash recipes, as well as on Chef Tammy Brawley's website at greenkitchenrichmond.com. Poultry, including eggs, chicken, and turkey sales, is the largest livestock sector in Virginia's farm economy, with a total economic impact of $12.5 billion. Almost 279 million chickens are raised for meat in the Old Dominion each year on 1,074 farms. That makes Virginia the 10th largest chicken-producing state in the country. Virginia is sixth in the nation for turkey production at 16.8 million birds. Industry experts say there'll be plenty of turkey available for this year's Thanksgiving holiday. Blacksburg is home to many a Hokie fan. However, as Burke Muller reports, surrounding Montgomery County is also home to numerous farms, and agriculture is a mainstay of the local economy. Located in southwest Virginia, Montgomery County is home to Virginia Tech, one of the oldest public land-grant universities in the country. But there's more agriculture taking place in the county than what goes on here on campus. Fall is arguably the best time to visit Montgomery County, with the leaves beginning to turn and the lush rolling green hills. The dominant crop produced here is hay, while the dominant livestock raised here is beef cattle. Casey Cole has a hand in both. We seem to be in uh, what is very common here in Montgomery County, uh, small beef cattle operations. Uh, a lot of those beef cattle operations making hay uh, for their operation. Uh, a lot of that has evolved. Uh, in the time, the, the 20 years that I've been doing this as uh, the population from Virginia Tech has grown, uh, the need for land has changed uh, from agriculture to residential. And while Virginia Tech's expansion in recent years has put pressure on land prices in Montgomery County, farmers here are finding ways to stay productive and to take the benefits the school offers. Virginia Tech plays a very large role in the Montgomery County um, economy. And uh, there are a lot of things that Virginia Tech feeds, uh, including myself. There, I have customers, uh, hay customers, and uh, they, they have equine, they have small beef operations, they might have sheep operations. And those folks are employed by tech. Bill McDonald's family has been farming his Montgomery County land since colonial times. He's the seventh generation to farm here. He sells purebred cattle to farmers throughout the region through auction and private sales. Basically what we have to sell in southwest Virginia is grass and the way we harvest that is through cattle, sheep, uh, goats, dairy cattle. Um, so we are a seed stock producer and we raise Simmental, Simangus and Angus seed stock. We have an annual bull sale the first Saturday in April and then do private treaty sales after that and sell most of our females private treaty. Like other producers in the county, McDonald sees the pressure Virginia Tech is putting on land prices, but he has hope for future generations. Agriculture uh, is just like everything else. It's not the strong that survive, it's the adaptable 
that survive. And so we'll have to adjust to whatever challenge we, challenges we have coming our way. Um, my son is uh, doing some horse training. And the one thing about it, people always seem to enjoy having horses around where they may not want other uh, livestock around. Montgomery County has a total of 584 farms, covering 101,672 acres. The market value of all agricultural products is $24,296,000. Nearly a third of that income is from livestock, producing $16,962,000. Cattle and calves make up most of that at $10,337,000. Milk from cows is about half that, at five million four hundred and seventy-nine thousand. Crops bring in a total of seven million three hundred and thirty-five thousand. Hay and other crops bring in two million eight hundred and nineteen thousand, while nursery and greenhouse producers account for two million one hundred and two thousand dollars. Virginia Tech's agriculture connections are not limited to the main campus in Blacksburg. There's also the Kentland Farm Facility, about a 15-minute drive from campus, where they raise dairy and beef cattle, as well as row cops. It's great hands-on experience for the next generation like Bailey Watson. As president of the Virginia Tech Young Collegiate Farmers Group, she helped organize a new Virginia love sign for a recent agriculture event on campus. And that's not all the group is involved in. I know it says Collegiate Young Farmers, but we're focused around everything in the agriculture industry and we have members from all aspects of the majors in the College of Ag and Life Sciences and outside of cows because um, you know we need people who are not just agriculturalists. Watson grew up on a farm in Wythe County and both of her parents are Virginia Tech alumni. She's a junior and not entirely sure what she wants to do when she graduates but farming is her passion. I'm leaning towards more like of a communications based side or something that allows me to advocate for all aspects of the agriculture industry. Um, of course, I'm, I'm more, I enjoy the animal aspect more. Um, my family owns beef cattle now. We run a cow-calf operation. Um, so I really enjoy being around cattle and sheep too. We also have some sheep. Virginia Tech is also home to one of two large animal veterinary schools in the state. Dr. D. Whittier taught at the Virginia Maryland Regional College of Veterinary Medicine for 35 years. He and his son now raise beef cattle in both Montgomery and Pulaski counties. He's seen a lot of change in the cattle industry in that time. The dairy industry uh, nationally has uh, changed a whole bunch. Uh, milk is produced by large dairies, and uh, when I say large, I mean thousands of cows. Uh, and our uh, feed availability and land ownership patterns in Virginia have just not made uh, us able to get into the mega dairy business. And uh, as it turns out, uh, the economy of scale is huge in the dairy industry, and that's meant that the small dairies have had a hard time competing. And so uh, uh, the ones that are left are good, uh, bless their hearts, they work hard, uh, but uh, it's pretty tough to compete with, uh, with the mega dairies. And so uh, that uh, basically what happened is that uh, beef cattle replaced those dairy cattle as the uh, time rolled on. Whittier's roots are in Utah, and he originally planned to move back west when he retired, but the area's beauty changed his mind. Somewhere through the years, we just kind of became Virginians, and, and uh, you know, Blacksburg, Virginia is just a marvelous place to live. Uh, you know, there's still a lot of countryside. Uh, there's uh, plenty of services uh, to meet my family's needs. It has four seasons, and none of them tear you up, you know. Uh, uh, we have a uh, little heat during the summer and a little cold during the winter, uh, but uh, we have beautiful springs and beautiful falls, and uh, and you know it's a it's a wonderful place to uh, to produce beef cattle. It uh, rains enough and uh, winters are short enough and uh, summers are not so hard and beef cattle uh, thrive. They do very well here. Montgomery County farmers are also finding ways to do well here even as growth in and around Blacksburg shows no signs of slowing down. In Montgomery County, Virginia, I'm Burke Muller reporting. We're so glad you could join us this week to celebrate all the bounty Virginia has to offer. From the kitchen to your home and garden to our beautiful wide open spaces, we are proud to say that this is real Virginia.
For everyone from the Virginia Farm Bureau, thanks for watching. Make it a great week. Chesapeake Bay, Atlantic to Appalachia, home in my heart always. They're out there on the front lines, the brave, the dedicated, the relentless. But there's another front line. The one that helps nourish all others while facing epic struggles of their own. So in this season of uncertainty, a few things remain certain. The rain will fall. The sun will shine. And together, we'll continue to grow. Hey, Bobo, do trees tell each other stories? I'm sorry, I'm afraid I don't know that. Hey, why don't we go find out? Listen. Do clouds take naps? I couldn't tell you. Dad, do stars visit their friends? Look! Look at you. You're at the top of your game. You're unstoppable. Nothing can throw you off track. Wait, is that your car? Uh-oh. Yeah, I saw that coming. That will throw you off track. You're looking at around 10 grand in fines, legal fees, and increased insurance rates. Let's try this again. Smart move. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. Observe a domesticated human family in their natural habitat, known to their species as the backyard. Hey, you think I should light it now? I think it's good. Yeah. Oh dear, someone is about to burn a pile of debris that's too tall, which can start a wildfire. Wait, what could it be? Blimey, oh, it is. It's Smokey. It's Smokey Bear. What a legend. What's hey, here? it's Smokey. Sorry, it was too high. Right. Watch as he astutely ensures that there's no wind and how he removes some of the debris to create a smaller, safer burning pile. No, you, you, see, make it no, you can't make it bigger, baby. The bigger, the better. Take note right. of our fearless furry friend here, yeah. humans. I appreciate it. Fist bump. <laughs> <laughs> Watching you. Smokey's done it again. Bye, Smokey. Only you can prevent wildfires. <laughs>